What's up everyone, it's Kenji here, and in this video I thought I'd go over the venture capital industry. So firstly we'll be looking at a definition of venture capital, then we'll look at their structure and how they make money, thirdly we'll go over their investing strategies, and lastly we'll look at the career options in the industry, looking at things like the hiring process, the skills required, and so on. So let's get into it. And thank you to The Daily Upside, a free business and finance newsletter, for sponsoring this video. So what is venture capital? Simply put, venture capital is money provided by investors to startups that have high growth potential. In exchange, that startup is going to give them a stake in their company, so equity basically. That VC then hopes that the startup will grow, and with it, its stake is going to grow as well. Eventually, they hope to be able to sell it for more in the future. Taking a more macro view, when looking at the different asset classes, Venture capital falls into the alternative investments category, which is the same bucket as private equity, hedge funds, real estate, and a couple other investments. So it isn't really an area that normal people like you and I might invest in, instead it's mainly for industry professionals. In terms of the risk return trade-off, it's definitely up there as some of the highest risk as well as the highest return. That's typically the case for most alternative investments as well. The majority of the startups that the VCs invest in actually end up failing, but that's fine, they're really only looking for one home run that's going to offset all of those losses. So it's usually around 1 in 10 investments that really becomes a winner. So it's definitely high risk and high potential reward. Another reason that it's perceived as risky is because it's an illiquid investment. So liquidity is a measure of how easily something can be converted into cash. So here's the liquidity scale for you. Among the most liquid assets are stocks in big companies like say Apple or Amazon, mainly because everybody's buying and selling them and so it's very easy to find a counterpart that's going to be happy with your price to buy or to sell. On the other hand, among the most illiquid assets are real estate, where it might take even multiple years for you to be able to buy or sell a house. That's because there's many parties involved, there's a lot of contracts, regulations and so on. So venture capital definitely falls onto the more illiquid side of the scale. That's primarily because once you have your money invested in a venture capital fund, they've invested in startups and so they can't really take that money out until that startup actually has performed because who would want to buy a startup that nobody really knows or isn't selling anything yet. But before we continue, I want to talk about the daily upside. They're a free business and finance newsletter with over 200,000 subscribers, myself included, when I signed up about half a year ago. It was founded by a former investment banker who spent a decade on Wall Street. Every weekday, they deliver a morning brief, followed by more detailed stories that are shaping the business world. It's about a 5-minute read, giving a high-level, unbiased analysis with an occasional dose of wit to keep things interesting. Recently, I've been enjoying their weekend edition newsletter, which goes deeper into specific topics. For example, they previously did a deep dive on the very topic of this video, where they had a very interesting piece on venture capital, which covered the growth trends of both the startups and the VC backers. They also include charts and other visuals to help understand the story. As you can see from this chart over here, both the investment amounts and the number of investments have continued to grow this past year. So if you want to stay on top of the latest business and finance news, check out the link down in the description to sign up to the Daily Upside. It's completely free and if you don't like it, you can always unsubscribe. Alright, let's now continue with the structure of VC funds. And right in the middle you're going to have the Venture Capital Fund, and there's going to be two main types of contributors, so two main types of people that are going to be putting money in there. On the one hand, it's a Venture Capital Firm, which is also known as the General Partner, and on the other hand, it's going to be investors, which are known as limited partners. These are usually institutional investors, so things like insurance companies, endowment funds, and so on. The large majority of the fund's money is going to come from the limited partners, which are the institutional investors. But a small portion of that is going to come from the general partners, just to align their interests and make sure that they have skin in the game as well. Once the fund has all the money, they're going to invest in different startups, that's going to consist of their investment portfolio. Of the money invested, investors are going to be expecting around 25-35% to annual returns by the end of their investment. That being said, they usually don't come across all of the different startups, instead one startup is usually going to have the home run, so say they have 400% returns, while the other ones have close to zero, and so that's going to give them that 25-35% to balance in the end. As for the compensation for the VC, it's usually split into two main parts. Firstly, you're going to have the management fee, which is a fixed fee of around 2-3% to of the assets under management, which are going to be paying for things like the operational expenses, so the employee cost, the office rent, and so on. Now this part is guaranteed, so regardless of whether the fund is up or if it's down one year, they're still going to be paid that same amount. 
On the other hand, there's what's known as a performance fee, which is dependent on the gains of the company, so how well it's doing, how well it's performing. Usually that's around 20 to 30% that goes to the venture capital firm, while the remaining 70 or 80% goes to the investors. But these performance returns are only realized when they exit the position, so when they sell their investment. And there's really three main ways that they can exit a position as a VC fund. The first one has to do with an IPO, which is probably the most glamorous process. It's short for an initial public offering. That's when you hear the iconic bell on the New York Stock Exchange say. A recent example of it could be Rivian's IPO. Similar to that, there is an acquisition by a bigger company. In an example, perhaps not so recent now, has to do with Microsoft's acquisition of LinkedIn. And the third option is a direct sale. This means you can either sell it to another VC fund that's maybe at a, at a later stage, or similar to that, you can actually sell it to the company itself. So if you invest in a startup, that startup can then later buy your stake in the company. Let's now look at the investment strategies. And within the venture capital space, most funds specialize in particular timings, so particular stages of a company, particular industries, as well as geographies. So let's look into them. When it comes to timing, these are the investment rounds. So typically it's going to start with the pre-seed or the seed stage. And this is really when it's just an idea. From there, it's going to move on to a series A where they're hopefully starting to build a product. After which there's the series B where let's say that they're having a lot of growth and maybe they're starting to make some revenue. And from there, there's series E's, D's, E's, etc. And that's all going to culminate ideally in the IPO, which is when they sell their shares in the public markets. And in these later funding rounds where the amounts are usually bigger, it's not just VCs that are involved. Usually private equity funds and more specifically growth equity funds are involved in there as well. So that's how it looks when it comes to the stages of a company, but that's not the only focus. Some VCs also specialize in particular industries. That said, they are primarily tech-based, that's because they want scalable business models and tech sort of enables that. But within tech, there's actually many different branches. So it could be educational tech, so edtech, fintech for financial technology, or it could also be biotech for biology. And the last major filter is geography, which to be honest is fairly self-explanatory. But there are some big funds that don't necessarily have a particular focus. For example, if we look at Sequoia's website over here, which is one of the biggest funds out there, they cover most regions in the world. Lastly, looking at the career options in the industry. And here's what the hierarchy looks like. It goes from analyst, associate, principal, and finally the partners. And these might be further split into junior and senior roles. For example, you could have a junior associate or a senior associate. And even though the analyst role is the most junior level here, it's usually not for people that are fresh out of college. Instead, it's for people that have maybe two to three years of experience, either working at a consultancy, a bank, big tech company, or even a fast growing startup as well. It is possible to get in fresh out of college with no experience, but that's definitely not the norm. The associate level is for people either pre-MBA, post-MBA, depending on how much experience they have. And for the partners, this isn't really a quote-unquote conventional job, mainly because they have money invested in the fund themselves. And so you can't just quit any day because you feel like it. It is quite common for these partners to be former entrepreneurs themselves, as is the case of, say, Reid Hoffman, who's a partner at Greylock, and who was actually the co-founder of LinkedIn, which then sold to Microsoft like we saw earlier. Some BCs also have another role, which doesn't really tie into the hierarchy, which is known as the entrepreneur in residence. This is basically a usually a former entrepreneur that's there consulting some of their companies and maybe even taking on an executive role at one of the startups as well. In terms of the hours, it obviously depends on the size of the fund as well as the number of deals that they're getting, but a general rough guide is around the 60 hours per week mark, which is better than the 80 hours that you might have at an investment bank or the 70 at a management consultancy. It's more or less on par with the 60 hours that you might find in big tech as well. That said, these work hours are sometimes blurred because it requires quite a lot of networking and other social activities that some people might consider work while others might not. Here's a breakdown by Harvard Business Review on how they spend their time. As you can see, a large portion of their time is actually helping out startups, consulting for them, as well as helping them with their recruiting efforts. When it comes to the skills required for a junior employee, it typically has to do with research, where you're going to be trying to assess the latest industry trends and trying to find some of the more exciting startups. Similar to that is going to be networking, where you'll hopefully be talking to some of the founders as well as other relevant people. And then there's going to be business strategy, trying to assess whether a particular startup's business model is going to be something that's gonna be successful in the future. 
And lastly, although perhaps a bit more relaxed than a traditional finance role, it is quite common to be using spreadsheets on your day to day to try to analyze things. Looking at some additional resources for you, if you're interested in learning more about the venture capital space, here's a list of 10 of the biggest venture capital firms out there. You might want to see if they have any job openings or try to understand their business models better. Also, I'll leave a few articles in the description that I think could be useful for you. If you want to learn about private equity, check out this video over here. And if you want to learn about asset management, check out this other video over here. That's all for this one. Hit the like, hit the subscribe if you liked it, and I'll catch you in the next one.